Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I'm president of the City Club's Board of Directors. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Richard Rothstein, a research associate of the Economic Policy Institute and a senior fellow of the Chief Justice Earl Warren Institute on Law and Social Policy at the University of California Berkeley School of Law. That, by the way, may have been the longest title that we've ever had here at the uh, City Club for a speaker, but it's befitting given our speaker's thought leadership and informed challenging of conventional wisdom. I will say it is impossible to capture the essence of his brilliant scholarship in a two-minute introduction, so it's a good thing today that we have 30 minutes of hearing from him followed by our traditional City Club Q&A period. The Economic Policy Institute, or EPI, is as stated at its website, quote, a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank created in 1986 to include the needs of low and middle income workers in economic policy discussions, end quote. EPI substantial areas of research include education, inequality and poverty, and race and ethnicity. In the area of education, quoting again from EPI's website, the institute, quote, documents impacts of social and economic inequality on student achievement and suggests policies within school and out to narrow outcome gaps between middle class and disadvantaged students. EPI research refuses false assumptions behind politically inspired attacks on public education teachers and their unions, end quote. Mr. Rothstein's work in the aforementioned areas includes an October 2014 report entitled The Making of Ferguson, Public Policies at the Root of Its Troubles. In that report, our speaker challenges conventional explanations of the causes of suburban segregation. In commentary issue just this past January, Mr. Rothstein wrote on the impact a United States Supreme Court ban on the so-called disparate impact standard may have on housing integration. Mr. Rothstein earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard College. Prior to associating with EPI, Mr. Rothstein was a lecturer at Teachers College at Columbia University and a visiting scholar in the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He served as a national education columnist for the New York Times and currently serves as contributing editor for the American Prospect Magazine. Mr. Rothstein has co-authored or authored books on accountability in education, the Black-White Achievement Gap, Charter Schools, and Equality in the Context of Public and Private Education. I'm proud to present on behalf of the City Club of Cleveland, Richard Rothstein. Mr. Rothstein. Thank you very much, and thanks for inviting me to be with you today. Evidence continues to accumulate that despite our off-stated vows to close the achievement gap in educational outcomes between black and white students, we cannot close that achievement gap in segregated schools. We know the benefits of, of, of integration. There have been numerous econometric studies demonstrating that when we have had integrated schools, the achievement of disadvantaged students rises without any harmful effect on the achievement of advantaged students. Yet our schools are becoming more and more segregated over time. Now we know two separate things about the impact of social and economic disadvantage on student achievement. One is that individual aspects of social and economic disadvantage translate directly into lower achievement. Now this does not mean that any disadvantaged child is predetermined to achieve at a lower level. There's a distribution in outcomes of every human characteristic, and there'll always be some disadvantaged children who will achieve at higher levels than typical middle class children. But on average, disadvantaged children will always achieve at lower levels, no matter how high quality their schools. And one of the tragedies and perversions of our current education policy is we hold out an impossible goal of closing the achievement gap without closing, which is something we will never do, the differences in the characteristics of children from different social classes and different family backgrounds. In every industrialized country, there's an achievement gap between 
upper class and lower class children, between middle class and lower class children because of their characteristics. For example, children from homes where parents are more highly educated have more books in their home. Their parents speak to them more. There was a study done uh, some 30 years ago now in which tape recorders were placed in the homes of families of different social classes. And what they found was that infants and toddlers, up to the age of three, if they were in families where the parents were middle class professionals, were hearing an average in the background of 2,000 words an hour. Infants and toddlers in families where their parents were working class, uh, working class families were hearing an average of 1,300 words an hour. And infants and toddlers with families were on welfare were hearing an average of 600 words an hour. The authors of the study, two, two uh, social scientists at the University of Kansas, called these meaningful differences and showed how this and other characteristics of home literacy environment translated directly into average achievement differences of children when they got to school, no matter how high quality the schools were. Of course, higher quality schools will achieve more for disadvantaged students who hear only 600 words an hour than lower quality schools will. But it is absurd to think that high quality schools will achieve the same on average for children who come to school with impoverished literacy backgrounds than children who come to school with rich literacy backgrounds. Now it's not just uh, parenting and, and the quality of literacy uh, in, in the home that affects uh, differences in achievement by social class. Let me give you one very recent development that I've been studying that is having a terrible effect on the achievement of disadvantaged children. And that is the uh, ability of employers, of low-wage workers, to use computerization for much more just-in-time scheduling of work. So for example, retail stores, restaurants, uh, uh, warehouses can now predict workflow with precision just a few hours in advance. If a truck is late arriving to Cleveland, a warehouse can send workers home um, without before the completion of their shift, knowing they won't have work to do. <clears throat> give you, uh, let me give you some statistics about this. For black hourly workers, <coughs> excuse me, for black hourly workers, 50% of them, half of all black hourly workers, receive their weekly schedules less than one week in advance. And having received those schedules, they're often, as I said, sent home early or called in outside their regular schedule. Mothers of children less than 13 years of age now receive their, 32% of them now receive their weekly schedules, one third of them, less than one week in advance. Now what does that have to do with schools? Well, parents with those kinds of variable schedules, those kinds of contingent schedules, can't plan regular meal times for their children. Their children don't have regular bedtimes. Their children can't be enrolled in regular childcare arrangements, which require drop off and pick up at, at predictable times. The idea that children in these circumstances, and their numbers are growing because of the way our economy is being reorganized, the notion that children in these circumstances can achieve at the same levels, on average, that children who have regular meal times, who have regular bedtimes, who are enrolled in high quality after school or preschool or early childhood programs, the notion that those two children, types of children can achieve at the same levels is absurd. Now, it is not only these individual characteristics, and there are many, many more of them, there are health differences between low and, and, and middle class children. Uh, the, 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 these individual characteristics affect the achievement of individual children. But what is much more important is that when you take children like this and concentrate them together, in the same classrooms and schools, the effect of these kinds of problems exacerbate and depress achievement even more. Because it's one thing if you have a child who hasn't had a regular bedtime or who hasn't had a, a regular meal. In a classroom of middle class children uh, where the teacher can pay special attention to that child, that's one thing. If you have a whole classroom of children with those characteristics, all the instruction has to be tailored to a different level. Much of the instruction has to be remedial. Teachers can't pay special attention to children with special problems because every child has a special problem. And so the achievement on average of classrooms like that is inevitably going to be lower than the achievement of uh, children in stable classrooms, 
where they're not moving around a lot. Mobility is another big issue in, in, in Cleveland as well as in the rest of the country. There are urban schools where there are 100% mobility per year, 100% mobility. That's as though uh, at the end of this lecture, every one of your seats was be occupied by a different person. That's 100% mobility. We have schools like that. The notion that schools like that, if only they have high expectations, if only they are accountable for high achievement, can achieve the same thing as schools without that kind of mobility is, as I said, absurd. Now, I've been writing and, and talking about this kind of thing for a long time. And then uh, about eight years ago, the Supreme Court issued a decision which prohibited the school districts of Louisville and Seattle from desegregating a very token uh, approach to desegregating schools. The schools of Louisville and Seattle had um, a choice program in which um, uh, children were able to choose schools, but if a school was oversubscribed and if their admission would racially unbalance the school, a child would be admitted who did not racially imbalance the school. And the Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional. You could not use a child's race in order to attempt to integrate a, a, the schools. And it was not surprising that the court made that decision. Chief Justice Roberts has um, for a long time argued that there can be no constitutional remedy for what he calls de facto segregation, the segregation of because uh, families happen to live in different neighborhoods by accident or because of uh, discri private discrimination or because of the choice of where they want to live. What was shocking was that the dissenting opinion by Justice Stephen Breyer argued that Yes, it was de facto segregation. It was just the acts of the, the schools were segregated in Louisville and Seattle. It is true because the neighborhoods are segregated by the accident of history. But he said in, in a de facto segregation situation, uh, you should be permitted to integrate even though you can't be constitutionally compelled to. And that, to me, indicated how far we've come from an understanding of the racial history in this country because it is not only Louisville and Seattle, but Cleveland and Detroit and Chicago and New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Kansas City and every city in between has been segregated not by accident, but by explicit, purposeful racial policy emanating from the federal, state, and local governments. We do not have de facto segregation in this country. We have explicit racial apartheid, and we have forgotten the history of how this came about. Now, what I want to spend a few minutes speaking with you today is what that history consists of, because unless we confront it, we're going to be unable to uh, approach the problem of desegregating our neighborhoods. And if we can't desegregate our neighborhoods, we can't desegregate our schools. The major driver of uh, the segregation of the metropolitan areas in this country, and this was not a southern problem, this was a problem, as I say, of Cleveland and every other major northern, midwestern, and western city. The major drivers of this policy were two. The first was the public housing pro uh, program of the federal, state, and local governments. Civilian public housing really began during the New Deal. It began under the Public Works Administration, and the Public Works Administration under the New Deal had a policy an explicit policy called the Neighborhood Composition Rule. The Neighborhood Composition Rule said that public housing could be inhabited by people only of the same race as the neighborhood in which it was located. This was explicit. Here in St. Louis, um, uh, here in Cleveland, I mean, there, there were public housing projects designated specifically for whites and public housing projects designated specifically for African Americans. Most public housing at that time was for whites because we had an enormous civilian housing shortage in this country, and public housing was the most desirable housing available for middle class and lower middle class families. Blacks were excluded from most public housing, but when there was public housing built for blacks, generally over the uh, course of the country, it was about a quarter of the public housing, a little bit less built for African Americans, and about three quarters built for whites in separate, in separate projects. Uh, very often, uh, integrated neighborhoods Working class neighborhoods, we didn't have a lot of public transportation in those days, and working class neighborhoods were integrated in, in major urban areas of this country. Integrated urban neighborhoods where workers could walk to factories were leveled in order to build public housing that was segregated. So the, sec the public housing program affected in not only 
perpetuated segregation but affected segregation. That was one policy that began the, the segregation of uh, our metropolitan areas in the 20th century. But then, as the civilian housing shortage began to ease after World War II, as uh, materials became available for, for housing construction, the Federal Housing Administration embarked on a program to subsidize the development of subdivisions and suburbs around cities across the country. They did this with a program under Title VI of the Housing Act at that time of guaranteeing bank loans for builders to construct subdivisions on condition. This was a federal condition, a condition of the Federal Housing Administration, that those homes be, cons be sold only to white families. The federal government even provided language in the deeds that builders could use preventing anybody who purchased a home from reselling it to an African-American. This was not an accident. This was an explicit federal policy. Many of you are familiar, I think, with some of the major developments, uh, although they, the smaller ones, subdivisions, were created in Cleveland and in every other uh, city in this country. The biggest ones were places like Levittown in New York, 17,000 homes built in 1947 with an explicit requirement by the federal government that no homes be sold to African Americans. Daly City in, in uh, south of San Francisco, uh, the subject of a Pete Seeger song, or Malvina Reynolds wrote it, called Ticky -ta about ticky-tacky houses on a hillside that some of you may have heard. Uh, uh, thousands of homes built with a federally required condition that no homes be sold to African Americans. Gradually, as these subdivisions in every major city came to be developed, the white population that was being housed in public housing was able to leave public housing for the racially exclusive, as I say, required um, uh, racially exclusive uh, projects uh, in the suburbs, and public housing then became the black public housing that many of us are familiar with today and that we consider to be an inevitable result of public housing. This was all the result of an explicit racial policy of the federal government. Blacks had to remain in public housing. Whites were given enormous incentives to leave. Uh, not only were these uh, subdivisions uh, built exclusively, but they were built with um, the, the no down payments for returning war veterans, for example, from World War II, and uh, with uh, amortized loans, whereby the, the white homeowners who left public housing and left urban areas were able to make monthly payments to service their loans that were less than the rent they were paying in apartments in urban areas. It was an enormous subsidization of the racial segregation of American cities. In 1949, uh, the uh, federal government uh, uh, proposed, President Harry Truman proposed, the National Housing Act to vastly expand the public housing uh, program of this country. Still, it was primarily for whites, uh, although the suburbs were beginning to be developed in the late 1940s. There was still a, still a, a remaining housing shortage, and we needed public housing for whites. President Truman proposed a, a national housing program to vastly expand public housing. And uh, conservatives, Republicans uh, in the House and Congress, who were opposed to any intervention of the public sector into private housing markets, came up with a device to ensure, they hoped, uh, to defeat public housing. Uh, they were led by uh, Senator Robert Taft, um, somebody that uh, Mr. Republican in your days, and Senator Taft proposed what he called, a po what we now call a poison pill amendment to the 1949 National Housing Act. Senator Taft proposed that all public housing amendment, that all public housing uh, financed by the federal government had to be integrated. Knowing full well that if this amendment were passed, Southern Democrats would then vote against public housing and there would be no public housing at all. So liberals in the United States Congress led by Paul Douglas, a liberal senator from Illinois, Hubert Humphrey, liberal senator from Minnesota, campaigned against the integration amendment and persuaded their fellow senators and congressmen to defeat the integration amendment in order to save the public housing bill. So public housing at the, under the leadership of liberals in the Senate was created, in, expanded in 1949 under the Housing Act as a segregated program. You're all familiar, or maybe you are familiar with, with uh, the way in which public housing then began to deteriorate. Uh, the two towers in St. Louis that were blown up, dynamited, uh, the Pruitt-Igo Towers, 
Pruitt was built for um, black families, and Igo was built for white families. And uh, as the uh, suburbanization of St. Louis took place and the federal government subsidized the movement of white families out of um, uh, the uh, central city, there were no more white families left to inhabit the public housing projects. There were many white vacancies uh, in the white projects with long waiting lists in the black projects. And finally, these projects uh, became all black and segregated, deteriorating uh, communities. Levittown, I mentioned a minute ago, Levittown at the time, in 1947, sold for, those homes sold for $7,000 a piece, $7,500 a piece. So roughly two and a half times national median income, or if you convert that to today's dollars, that's about two and a half times national median income. So in today's dollars, Levittown homes were, sell were selling to returning war veterans and working class, lower middle class, uh, white families for about $125,000 in today's dollars. Today, those homes sell for $400,000, $450,000, seven times national median income. Passing a law in 1968 that says we can no longer discriminate in housing does not give African American families, lower middle class families, access to Levittown. Levittown today is still less than 5% black. In a metropolitan area, that's 23% black. Meanwhile, the white families who moved into Levittown gained over a half century of equity appreciation. The difference between $125,000 and $450,000, less perhaps some remodeling that might, they might have done in the meantime. That equity appreciation they used to send their children to college and their grandchildren to college. Uh, whites uh, have um, uh, many times the inheritance than black families do of the same incomes, mostly because of housing equity. So this has created, this, this federal program has created a two-class, racial class, caste system in this country. As I say, simply passing laws saying it's no longer permissible to discriminate is inadequate to redress this problem. We need very aggressive policies to redress it. And as I say, unless we regret, redress it, we are not going to be able to desegregate either neighborhoods or schools or close the achievement gap for the reasons I've described. Now, this history, and I, there are many, many more details to it. It was not just the, the housing, the public housing and the Federal Housing Administration's uh, subsidization of suburbs that was involved. There were local policies involved. There were police actions that were involved. Uh, uh, unprosecuted uh, arson of any homes of African American families that dared to move into a white neighborhood here in Cleveland and elsewhere. Many, many other policies of this sort. Um, these policies have been entirely forgotten. We have deceived ourselves, convinced ourselves that we now have something called de facto segregation. Segregation by the accident of population movement, by the fact that black people happen to be poor and can't afford to live in middle class communities uh, because of private prejudice and so forth. We once understood this history much better. This is a recent memory failure that we have. Um, in 1968, uh, Richard Nixon uh, was elected uh, President of the United States, and he appointed as his Secretary of Housing and Development uh, someone named George Romney. George Romney um, uh, as understood the, the history that I've described to you very well. He was a Republican moderate, a Republican liberal, and he described the housing patterns that he was in charge of overseeing the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development as a white noose that the federal government had created around central cities. This was the Republican Housing and Urban Development Secretary speaking in 1968. He said, we need policies now to untie that white noose, to undo the, um, the, the federal, local, and state government policies that have segregated our metropolitan areas. And he proposed something called the Open Communities Program, under which um, he was going to deny federal funds for any purpose, whether for sewer projects or, or uh, landscaping or green space, uh, urban transit, uh, any of the projects that um, uh, metropolitan areas depend on from the federal government for. He was going to deny federal funding for any of these programs to any jurisdiction, suburban, affluent, any jurisdiction that didn't uh, follow three uh, 
policies. One is they had to abandon, repeal their exclusionary zoning ordinances. These were ordinances that uh, were established uh, in the mid 20th century for the purpose of excluding African Americans that uh, required homogeneous suburban areas where no multifamily dwellings could be, per could be constructed. So exclusionary zoning ordinances were the first uh, uh, part of this, this plan, repealing them. Second was they had to accept not high-rise public housing, but scatter site public housing uh, throughout their uh, jurisdictions so that the low-income and moderate-income populations would be distributed throughout metropolitan areas, not concentrated uh, within the white noose of the central cities. And third, they had to accept uh, builders who, accept, who had federal subsidies to build private low and moderate income housing. George Romney actually um, uh, refused funds, withheld funds from three suburban jurisdictions. Uh, there was a white backlash against his policies. Richard Nixon went, reined him in. George Romney was forced out as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and we haven't heard anything about untying the white noose since. We are not only um, forgetting the history that's necessary to uh, address these problems, because unless we follow problem programs that are like George Romney's and even much more aggressive than George Romney's to solve these problems, the problems will perpetuate. They are getting much worse. African-American children are more segregated today in schools they were, than they were 10 and 20 years ago. Neighborhoods are more segregated today than they were 10 and 20, 10 and 20 years ago. And we are doing nothing to educate ourselves about this history uh, in a way that we need to do in order to um, uh, address it. And we're doing nothing to teach our children about this history. In fact, we are misteaching our children. We're not only forgetting it, but we're covering it up and, if I may say, whitewashing it. I recently did a survey of the most widely used American history textbooks in uh, American high schools in this country, and this is what I found. The most widely used American history high school textbook is uh, published by uh, McDougall Littell. It's called The Americans, and in this 1,200-page textbook, a single paragraph is devoted to what it's called discrimination in the North. Within that paragraph, there is one passive voice sentence devoted to residential segregation, and it states, and I quote, African Americans found themselves forced into segregated neighborhoods. They woke up one day, and whoopie doo, here we are. <laughs> We're in a segregated neighborhood. That's it. That's what we're teaching high school students about this history, uh, this racial history of the 20th century. Another widely used textbook, Princess Hall's uh, United States History, also attributes segregation to mysterious forces. It says, quote, in the North, too, African Americans faced segregation and discrimination. Even where there were no explicit laws, de facto segregation or segregation by unwritten custom or tradition was a fact of life. African Americans in the North were denied housing in many neighborhoods. That is mendacious. It is a, a scandal that we are, this is what our curriculum on race consists of. Of course, it's got Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks. But aside from that, this is what our curriculum on race in our high schools consists of today. Unless we address this history, unless we acquaint ourselves with this history, we will not understand that we have a constitutional obligation to undo it. It's not an accident. It was created by public policy, and under our Constitution, public policy has an obligation to reverse it. And unless we reacquaint ourselves with this history, we will be under no obligation to reverse it, and we will continue to have the achievement gap, which is uh, not being closed, um, which is being perpetuated by the segregation of our schools in Cleveland and other areas of this country today. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Richard Rothstein, Research Associate at the Economic Policy Institute. We'll return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period, and we would ask that you start formulating your questions now, and please try to keep them brief and to the point. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV IdeaStream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. 
Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC, and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. One week from today, February 20, the City Club will host a panel discussion titled, Hacked, the Threat of Cybersecurity. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online at cityclub.org. Today's program is part of the Education Innovation Series, sponsored by a generous grant from the Nordson Corporation. We thank you for your support. And we welcome guests at tables hosted today by Cleveland State University, Cleveland Transformation Alliance, and the Northeastern Ohio Education Association. Thank you, too, for your support. And last but not least, we welcome students to today's program from the Ad Andrews Osborne Academy, Shaw High School, and St. Martin de Porres High School. Student participation is made possible by a generous grant from the Lobb Foundation. Students, why don't you stand and be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for a traditional City Club question and answer period, and we welcome questions from everyone here today, including guests. Holding the microphones today are Director of Programming, Stephanie Jansky, and Volunteer, Spencer Kiesel. Where's Ken Spencer? There he is. <laughs> First question, please. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank you for that wealth of information that we all uh, needed to have today. Um, there's something called uh, wraparound, which is being seen as a solution to closing the achievement gap in uh, segregated schools where students are provided with various non-academic uh, services, health clinics, and, and so forth. Um, how close do you think that comes to solving the problem of segregated schools and students not getting what they need? I think that those programs are very important. Uh, what over half a century of research by economists, sociologists, social psychologists has pretty consistently concluded is that about two-thirds of the achievement gap is attributable to what goes on outside of school in children's homes and families, and another third is attributable to the differences in quality in schools. With programs like that, we can begin to chip away at uh, those differences, and we can narrow the achievement gap. But the notion that we can close the achievement gap with those programs is, as I say, uh, not founded in, in a serious analysis. Every industrialized country has an achievement gap between its higher and lower class children because of the kinds of uh, backgrounds from which they came. We can narrow those backgrounds, but we don't have a classless society. We're not, we don't aspire to have a classless society. And so long as we do have differences in social classes, there are going to be differences in the advantages that children from some classes have compared to the differences that other classes have. So wraparound services are important. Uh, they, and some of them are expensive. Uh, after school programs, for example, that are of high quality are much more expensive than what's now the fad of extended learning time, which is m just more time devoted to what didn't work during the day. <laughs> so that's uh, high quality programs are expensive. High quality early childhood programs are expensive. Uh, and I'm not talking now about either pre-kindergarten. I'm talking about from birth to three, which is where most of the s initial skill development on which later skill development builds is based. Putting health clinics in every school is a very, very important program that will narrow the gap in the kinds of um, health differences that uh, children, black and white children, and uh, low-income children, and middle-class children have. Actually, that's less expensive to school districts because uh, having a full-service health clinic in a school with pediatricians and optometrists and dentists giving full-service preventive and, and um, uh, diagnostic care to, uh, to children is reimbursable by Medicaid, but state laws don't permit school health clinics to claim Medicaid reimbursement. So a simple change in, in state laws in many states around the country would, would um, make a big difference in these regards. But the point I want to emphasize the most is that these kinds of programs can make a difference. But if we claim 
that we're going to close the achievement gap with these or any other programs, what we're doing is we're setting up ourselves for failure and for being condemned as failures by the public. Because if we promise to do something that's impossible and not having an achievement gap between children with such different backgrounds is, uh, is, is an impossible feat, and then we don't accomplish it, why shouldn't public conclude that schools are incompetent, that teachers are failures, and that they should be privatized? So the important thing is to do what we can to narrow the achievement gap. Wraparound services is an important part of it, but not overpromise what they can accomplish. They can narrow the achievement gap. They can't close it. I'm curious, we have a, a rating system today that goes from uh, excellent with distinction to con through continuous improvement down to academic watch. Next fall, our school districts are going to start being rated A through F, and the ratings co tend to correlate with the kinds of factors you're talking about. Would you talk about the segregative effects of that rating system as we move forward from today? Well, uh, they're more than, they're very highly correlated. These rating systems uh, really just describe the social class of the students in the schools. And you can almost guarantee, uh, if you look at a school and what kinds of students they have there, what their social backgrounds are, you can tell what the rating is going to be. Uh, there are some schools, and this doesn't mean they're better schools. You know, many of these schools that are rated A because they happen to have a lot of uh, middle class children with highly educated parents add less value to those students than schools that are rated F with uh, parents that are, as I say, maybe working contingent schedules and are high school dropouts or graduates. Those are better schools, those F schools are actually better schools in terms of what they add to students than the A schools. But if you, most people don't understand that. And so if you label a school A through F, people who attend an integrated school, which might be a C school, are going to want to move their children to an A school. And that will, I think that's the point of your question, this will increase uh, the segregation of schools by uh, convincing people that these A through F ratings have anything to do with the quality of a school. Good afternoon. The uh, economic impact, uh, of course, has been absolutely fantastic, as revealed in your studies and those of others. What might have been the economic impact on those children raised, for example, during the Depression? I'm sorry, I don't follow your, your question. Uh, well, the economic impact has been significant on the results obtained in schooling and education in current studies. In other economic times, for example, during the Depression, what was the effect comparable to the results we see today? Okay, there, there are two things I want to say in response to that. First, um, leaving aside the Depression for a minute, there was just as much of an achievement gap between middle class um, American students and recent immigrants in the early part of the 20th century as there is today between black and white students. Um, the, uh, uh, the whole special education program in this country was developed because Italian students were supposed to be stupid and needed to be in remedial classes. They were retarded. They were held back. Um, it took three generations before Italian students began to move up the economic ladder and uh, achieve at comparable levels to other white middle class students. The Depression, I don't mean to say that, that any short term economic uh, uh, catastrophe is it's going to have some effect, but it's not going to have an enduring effect. When we talk about social class, we're talking about long-term patterns that are developed in families. A recent study uh, uh, by a book that I recommend to all of you by Patrick Sharkey called Stuck in Place shows that African-American children who live in poor neighborhoods are likely to have mothers who also lived in poor neighborhoods. White families, white children who live in poor neighborhoods are likely not only to have mothers who lived in middle class neighborhoods, but they themselves are likely to live in middle class neighborhoods. So for black families, living in a poor neighborhood is a multi-generational phenomenon. And for white families, uh, children living in a poor neighborhood is a, um, uh, uh, an episodic phenomenon. Likewise, if a family is poor for a, because of a, uh, an economic recession or even a depression, that doesn't change its social class characteristics. Uh, there were many college-educated poor people 
in um, uh, the United States during the Depression. They still read to their children. They still uh, uh, talked complex language at home. I remember there's some, there's some very unsophisticated things that go on about this, this kind of stuff. I remember reading a book a, a few years ago, well, a few, almost 20 years ago now, called No Excuses, which was intended to prove that um, uh, the kinds of things I'm talking about were just excuses and that if only you had a good school, usually it was a private school, that had high expectations and held teachers accountable, that children would have high achievement no matter what their social background was. And it went through about 20 of these schools that allegedly had high achievement and were poor children and uh, uh, had low test scores, uh, and had high test scores, rather, poor children and high test scores. And I started to look at each one of these 20 some odd schools. One of them was a school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where all the children were on free and reduced lunch. The families were poor. When I looked at it, it turned out that these were all children of graduate students at MIT and, and Harvard. <laughs> the stipends were low. The stipends were low, and, and uh, you know, they had high test scores. The fact that their, their parents had low incomes while they were in graduate school didn't give them the kinds of uh, problems that African-American families in urban ghettos have with multi-generational poverty. So social class, I, I'm making a serious point, social class is a very complex phenomenon. It's just not just how much income you have in any given year. It's a whole range of characteristics. It's permanent income, it's wealth, it's uh, parental education, uh, and all of these things interact to create social class differences. I wonder if you think that a majority of the Supreme Court would agree with you, that is, even given a proper understanding of the discriminatory housing policy history, does there exist a constitutional duty to correct it when the governing mantra seems to be that the way to stop racial discrimination is to stop discriminating on the basis of race? Uh, no, the Supreme Court would not agree with me, but I can see from looking at you that I'm a lot older than you are, and I can uh, remember things that have changed uh, quite a bit over time. I'm not talking about an argument to be made to the present Supreme Court. The present Supreme Court, I doubt that I would even get two votes uh, on the Supreme Court for this argument. That doesn't mean that it's constitutionally wrong. When Thurgood Marshall uh, began his campaign to desegregate elementary and secondary education, he had a 20-year plan. He started in 1933. And he had a gradual step-by-step -step plan. Uh, first he was going to, uh, he figured that, that maybe justices could understand that uh, lawyers couldn't get a good education in uh, segregated law schools. So he first attacked law schools, and then he attacked graduate schools, and then he attacked uh, colleges. And only then, uh, in, in about 1950, did he begin to address the issue of segregation in elementary and secondary schools. So. What I'm saying is that the argument that I'm making, the constitutional argument that I'm making, which I think is a valid constitutional argument, is the correct constitutional argument. I, I, I have no hesitation in saying that Justice Roberts is wrong, that even Justice Breyer is wrong. Uh, but in order for that to change, it's going to take a long process of re-educating the American public. The Supreme Court is not going to go where we fear to go. And if the American public, even progressives in, in the American uh, political system, don't understand that we have a de jure system of segregation, then it's absurd to think that you can make an argue to, argument to the Supreme Court that they'll buy. So I think we need to re-educate uh, um, ourselves, the people we deal with, and our young people, whom we're miseducating and guaranteeing that this myth of de facto segregation will persist for another generation. So no, the Supreme Court today will not buy this argument. I think maybe I might have one vote. And she's, she may be ill. Um, when I moved to the first tier suburb of East Cleveland, I had friends, both black and white friends, who were concerned about whether I was going to be safe and who were concerned that they might not come and visit me. And I attributed that to the negative media coverage of our area. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on the media coverage and the effect that has on the segregation that damages our children. Well, certainly media coverage is part of it. But again, unfortunately, like everything I've been talking about, there's a, it's a complex interaction of a lot of different things. Look, think of it that, think, imagine this. You have a population in Cleveland and in other uh, metropolitan areas 
where African Americans are constricted in a uh, ghetto in the inner city. This, I'm not talking about the present time, I'm talking about the past. There's very little housing that's available to them. Their population grows. The area that is available to them gets more and more crowded, overcrowded, because they are not permitted to purchase homes in uh, other areas. Because the supply of housing is short and the demand is high for African Americans, their rents are higher than comparable rents in white neighborhoods. City services decline. Uh, one of the things that the Kerner Commission found in 1968 was in, not just in Cleveland, but in cities around the country, African American ghettos got less garbage collection, less street paving, less street lighting than white neighborhoods. Families, in order to pay rent, um, and they couldn't get mortgages because the Federal Housing Administration redlined um, African American communities and would not uh, give mortgages to homeowners in African American communities. So they paid high rents. In order to make the high rents, they doubled up, they subdivided their homes. Uh, the, the, the neighborhood, in effect, became a slum. That's what it was. It was a slum. It was not a comfortable middle class neighborhood. Well, what do uh, white people in middle class areas think when they look at an African American neighborhood? They think that these are slum dwellers. They become fearful that if black people move into their neighborhoods, they'll bring slum characteristics with them. They don't understand that the slum characteristics were created by public policy. They understand, they think that these are characteristics of the people who live in these neighborhoods. So you get white flight. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And so you need to intervene with policy in order to redress this. So I'm not suggesting the media isn't responsible. I'm not suggesting that white prejudice isn't responsible. They all come together. But the public policy creates the stereotypes that then people draw racial conclusions from instead of understanding that these are the results of public policy. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Rothstein. I'm Anthony Price. I'm a junior at Shaw High School. And you stated earlier context that outlined uh, what teenagers or young leaders or the youth can do in their community. So my question is, what can teenagers do to change things? And for example, we had a, a youth forum here earlier in the year, a conversation on race. And that was a topic that was touchy, but we had to discuss. And so we received positive feedback from that forum. So what can teens do to change things in their communities or in their uh, cities? Well, that's a tough question. I, I admit I haven't thought about it very much. But one thing you can do, um, based on what I said earlier, is demand that your teachers stop misteaching the history of Cleveland. <laughs> you know, edu educate, yourself, educate yourselves about this history and insist that it become part of the curriculum. That would be uh, you know, one step. I, I'm, there are probably many, many other things that you could do, and I just haven't uh, uh, thought much about them. But I'd recommend this. this is, you know, as somebody who's studied education for a long time, I'm obsessed about this textbook issue. I, I, <laughs> really upsets me. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your, all of your work over many, many years. We all owe you a debt of gratitude. And I do have some ideas for you, so I'm going to find you afterwards. Um, I, I appreciate in particular how untweetable what your uh, things, <laughs> the things that you have to say are, how history and housing and education and inequality are all intertwined. But no, nobody has done more than your organization to shed light on how the declining worker rights and the rise in inequality contributes. And I just wondered if you could say a little bit about the, uh, the future going forward as we see more demands on workers' time, fewer rights for workers, workers working more hours, and less equality in our society, and how that relates to some of the things you've raised today. Well, I, I think I, I addressed that a little bit when I talked about the new contingent scheduling that um, is becoming more and more prevalent. You know, we can do something about this. Um, the, there was a bill introduced in Congress uh, last summer that went nowhere requiring call-in pay. That is, if workers show up to work on their regular schedule and are sent home without having uh, been given the work that they were scheduled for, the employer has to pay them nonetheless. I would, uh, uh, we should have overtime requirements. I mean, these, th these are labor market reforms that uh, you know, other industrialized countries uh, have. They have much more labor, as you know, much more labor market regulation than we do. Uh, we could have overtime policies that um, require overtime to be paid if workers are um, kept at work beyond their regularly scheduled shift because of a late shipment or because of a surge in customers. 
Um, even if that extra time isn't more than eight hours in a day or 40 hours in a week, so long as it's more than their regular time, and it disrupts their, ch their schedules with their children. Um, those, and what I want to emphasize to you is these are education policies. These are not just labor market policies. They're education policies. We, for all the education reform that we talk about doing in schools, giving parents stable work lives would do more, I believe, to close the achievement gap than any education reform we can talk about. So regularizing, you know, higher minimum wage. I mean, this, is, this seems like a cliche. But you know, when, when workers can't earn a, an adequate living, it means they can't support their children. And if they can't support their children adequately, when, when workers get inadequate income, their children have fewer resources. And these translate into lower achievement. You know, one of the things I think that was one of the most disastrous education policies of the, last, uh, the late 20th century was when we created a Department of Education out of HEW, out of the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, and pretended that education was an institution in and of itself separated from all of the other social institutions that affect people's lives. And educators, I think, today have deluded themselves into thinking they're in a silo and that what they do is not impacted by all of these other forces. Educators not only need to understand the way in which they're impacted by these other forces, but I, I dare say they have to be advocates for these education policies of their labor market policies in order to enable parents to care for their children. Parents are less and less able to care, to, to care for their children today because of the increasingly deregulated uh, labor markets that uh, they face, particularly at the lower end of the occupational ladder. Good afternoon. Abria Robinson from St. Martin de Porres High School. I'm a senior. So for my senior capstone project, I've been focusing a lot on education and noticing how segregated our school systems are, and I don't just mean that racially. Also economically, and there's a huge difference between how all school systems are funded and St. Martin de Porres' mission statement is transforming urban Cleveland one student at a time. And they do that through work study programs where we all have the opportunities once a week to go to different job sites all day. So what other ways do you think that it would be possible for school, sy excuse me, school systems to implement success through different opportunities like work study? Well, you know, I'm, not, I'm not an educator. I, I'm a sociologist, historian, economist, but I'm not an educator. Uh, I, so I'm going to dodge your question a little bit. But what I am going to say is this. As I indicated earlier, I think what social science generally has established is about a third of the achievement gap is attributable to differences in qualities in schools. And um, I don't think, as I uh, said in answer to the um, uh, question earlier, that we're improving the quality of schools for disadvantaged children by this excessive obsession we have with accountability and testing. Uh, the whole purpose of, of um, education, to my, especially for disadvantaged children, in my way of thinking, is to get them to love learning, is to develop a love of learning. If we transform schools into things that they hate, because they're constantly being tested, constantly under stress, we're, even if their test scores rise, I'll acknowledge that test scores can rise if you drill them enough and, and uh, you know, narrow the curriculum enough. Um, even if their test scores rise, you're undermining their education in the long run. So I guess one of the things I would say is to, um, to the extent that you can't change what the schools are doing, anything that you can do to help broaden the curriculum that these children are exposed to, um, which is increasingly becoming just test preparation in, in basic skills, uh, would be a, an enormous benefit to disadvantaged children. Hi, can you tell us, are there school districts doing integration well? And if so, how are they doing it? Well, <laughs> in the major um, urban areas of this country, um, African-American ghettos are so geographically distant from affluent white communities that it is not possible to do integration well unless you have residential desegregation. 
But in smaller communities, and in, uh, on the outer edges of, of uh, even large communities, where there are adjacent low-income and middle-class communities, there are um, some productive efforts to increase integration. Uh, one of the uh, uh, ones I know best is Hartford, Connecticut, which um, does some busing. But you, know, you can't do busing in, in Detroit or you know, in, in the inner city. It's too far. Busing isn't a good idea anyway, in my view, because it uh, takes parents out of the school equation. But if you have relatively adjacent uh, low income and, and uh, more middle class schools, you can adjust attendance boundaries, you can uh, uh, create magnet schools. That the, there are the, a, a whole menu of programs that school districts have um, uh, experimented with, and they can work. But they can't work in the major metropolitan areas where the distances are just too great. And what you can't do, but well, you can do it, but which would not be successful, is if you try to have inner ring white communities take on the whole responsibility for integration. Where we need to integrate is in the affluent distant suburbs. And you only can do that with housing programs, not with, with uh, school programs. So. Um, Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we have been enjoying a Friday Forum with Richard Rothstein, Research Associate at the Economic Policy Institute. Thank you very much, Mr. Rothstein, for teaching us a lot today. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.